Last Sunday, the candles of hope and peace were lit. We will light those again as we remember that Christ will come again. The third candle of the Advent season is the candle of joy. It reminds us of the joy that Mary felt when the angel Gabriel told her that a special child would be born to her, a child that would save and deliver his people. It reminds us of the joy with which the angel announced to the shepherds that Jesus had been born. Do not be afraid, the angel proclaimed. I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. For to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, Christ the Lord. In silence, think about the gifts of God that bring you joy, the indescribable joy that overtakes us with pleasure and gratitude. We are gathered together in this house of joy. We joyfully remember that Christ promises a new life, a life in which the blind receive sight, the lame walk, and the prisoners are set free. We light this third flame to remember that Christ is the bringer of true and everlasting joy. Let us pray. God of hope, God of peace, God of joy, help us prepare our hearts to receive you. Our joy is the Lord. Kindle the joy in us, O Lord of light. Guide our path through gloom of night. How this flame can show the way, illuminating every day. Merry Christmas, Oneonta. Today's scripture reading comes from John chapter 6. I'm going to read verses 33 through 35. Now listen, this is God's word. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that you want to feed us. And Lord, we come to you hungry today, and we ask that as we study your word, Lord, that you'd open our hearts and our minds and fill us up, Lord, with your joy, your love, your peace, that we might be able to uh, share your love with others too. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, uh, we've been going through our series on Christmas around the world, and I have to say it's been a lot of fun learning about different Christmas traditions. Uh, last week we talked about Christmas greetings from around the world, but this week I want to talk about food. I love food. I bet you do too. Everybody loves food. And food is an integral part of cultural celebrations in every single part of this great, beautiful earth. Why? Well, because food brings life. It awakens our senses. It nourishes our being. It draws people closer together and form intimate communities and relationships. It's, food is a beautiful thing. It's a symbol of care, it's a symbol of fellowship, of love, of salvation, and so much more. We love food. And this week we're gonna study the deeper meaning behind Christmas food traditions. And here's just a few examples. The first one is in China. Now China is traditionally a Buddhist country. Uh, and so as a nation, it doesn't celebrate Christmas, but there are the Christian church in China is spreading like wildfire. And I learned this week in my research that Chinese Christians often give apples to one another during Christmas Eve. Why? Because the Chinese word for Christmas Eve, ping an ye, sounds very similar to the Chinese word for apple, which is ping hua. And so that's really interesting. Uh, on Christmas Eve, some ch Christians in China give each other an apple. Um, there's another one, an, a, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, it looks like Ries a la Mande, and it sounds French, but it's actually a Dutch recipe for almond rice pudding. Uh, it's a Danish rice pudding treat, and it's usually served at Christmas, Christmas dinner on Christmas Eve. 
Uh, and what's distinct about this is that this Danish rice pudding is served with a single peeled almond in it called the mandelgave. And it's hidden inside. And this little peeled almond creates a fun little prize because whoever finds the almond uh, is that lucky person who wins the prize. Um, in, in many parts of Central Europe, they love to, to bake and give out gingerbread during the Christmas season too. Gingerbread was established as a popular Christmas tradition in Central Europe across the, uh, during the Middle Ages after the Crusaders returned home from their wars. They brought a lot of spices with them and ginger was included. Now ginger is interesting because not only does it add a really great delicious kind of spicy flavor to it, but ginger itself is a natural preservative to the bread. It causes it to last longer. And so after mixing uh, the ginger into the bread dough, uh, it was baked into all kinds of really neat shapes and um, like patron saints, uh, gingerbread houses, Christmas themes. Uh, it, and the way they would do this, especially in places like in the Netherlands, and uh, good old, my good old friend Robert Vanderveen actually lent me some, oh, sorry for going off camera there. He lent me some authentic Dutch gingerbread baking trays. And these are in the shape of patron saints um, of those regions. I'm not sure which saints they are, but I thought this was so fascinating. They put the dough, the gingerbread dough, inside these uh, wooden molds and they stick them in the oven and it bakes it into a lot of, lots of different shapes. Isn't that fascinating? Here's another one, some beautiful smaller cookie shapes. Thanks to Robert for lending me these. Um, but the whole purpose of it really is, uh, is to create cookies that would last. Now you can see how this is also pointing to Jesus. I'll explain this later on. Um, let's move over to the Central America. Now let's talk about uh, Christmas tradition in making tamales. Corn tamales, originally a Mesoamerican uh, tradition, this dates all the way back to the Aztecs in 1200 BC. And what's happened was uh, that tamales were adapted into Mexican Christmas tradition much, much later on, uh, much more recently in the 16th century, when the influence of Spanish conquistadors came through the area. Now the Spanish conquistadors noticed that in the old tradition of human sacrifices, they said, no, no, human life is sacred. We don't want to do that. Um, and instead, what happened was the corn tamale, corn was believed to be uh, the thing in which human beings were made of in the ancient uh, traditions there. And so what happened was the tamale itself became a symbol of sacrifice. Um, and and as, this, uh, as this sort of ad was adapted in Central America um, into the Christmas tradition, you see how God was using traditions that existed and repurposing them and adding new meaning to them so that they would point to Jesus Christ. That's one thing that's really interesting about how traditions uh, change and evolve as new ideas are brought in. The gospel as well, moving from tradition to tradition, would often be adapted from previous traditions uh, and repurpose them to point to Jesus. So on the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, on December 12th through the Three Kings Day on January 6th, Mexican Christians would take ma ma masa dough, corn mix, which is filled with a meat, usually a pork, and they'd wrap it in a husk and they'd steam it to perfection. And I don't know if you've ever had Christmas tamales, but they are the best. I love them so much. You might be thinking, uh, okay, so here we have almond rice, we have corn tamales, we have gingerbread, um, and all of these are pointing towards uh, finding baby Jesus. Um, and you might think to yourself, why do these traditions talk about actually eating something that represents Jesus? That might seem a little bit unusual or a little bit strange. But this is actually a profoundly biblical concept that Jesus himself uses food as a metaphor for himself and what he has to offer in spiritual refreshment as well. Uh, one of the key texts that we see in the Bible that talk about this dynamic in the spiritual life is in John chapter 6. I'll give you a little bit of context here. After miraculously feeding the 5,000, Jesus and his disciples crossed over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. But the people who had been fed followed them. They went because they were still hungry. Their hungry had returned. And they were hoping Jesus would feed them more. And they also were hoping that Jesus would become their earthly king who would give them earthly bread and provide for them. Now Jesus wanted to point out to them that 
they didn't quite understand the purpose and the lesson behind his miracle of feeding the 5,000. And I'll pick it up in verse 25. Jesus said, when they found them on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Now notice they're asking Jesus, Jesus, how did you get across the Sea of Galilee? And notice, Jesus doesn't even answer their question. He cut right to the chase and he's revealing the focus behind their question. They wanted Jesus to be the Lord of their bellies, but Jesus wanted to be the Lord of their hearts. Verse 27, Jesus continued, he says, Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the Father has set his seal. Now what does this mean? Well, the Enduring Word Commentary says that Jesus was making a contrast between material and spiritual things. And it's almost universally true that people are more attracted to material things than spiritual things. A sign says, free money or free food often attracts much more attention than a sign that says spiritual fulfillment or even eternal life. Why is that? Well, it's a part of our sin nature. We are drawn to what we can see more than what is, is deeper and bigger in God's spiritual kingdom. And it's no wonder that Jesus being king over a spiritual kingdom of heaven, it's no wonder that people often misunderstood what he was saying or what he was offering to them when he said that he was their king. Verse 28, they responded to Jesus, what must we do to be doing the works of God? You know, isn't it so obvious uh, how telling, where the condition of their hearts based upon the question that they ask Jesus. They're trying to bargain with him. They're saying, oh, oh, I get it, Jesus. You give bread, right? Um, just tell me what God wants me to do, and I'll do it so you can give me more of that bread that you gave us the other day. And this is how we try to get most of the things in our life. It's focused on the exchange of temporary things. You know, there's an old joke about a guy. He's circling the car parking lot, trying to find a parking space during Christmas time at the mall. And he finally throws up his hands and he just starts to bargain with God. He says, okay, God, I know I'm, the mo I'm not the most religious person, but, you know, if you can just give me a parking spot right now, I promise I will change. I will go to church every Sunday. I'll give 10%. I will, I will stop cussing. And, uh, and then all of a sudden he stows, oh, wait, wait, I see, a, I see a parking space just opened up. Never mind, God, I got it. And that's often how our relationship with God goes. We say, Lord, feed me physically. Take care of me physically. Heal my body. Take care of these temporary problems in my life. And we look right past the biggest problem of all, which is that deep in our hearts, we don't want to trust in God to take care of us for our spirit and our soul and our eternal life. Truly, we want to take care of ourselves. And Jesus is saying, I fed you a miracle of bread that you might understand what I'm really trying to feed you in this moment. He says, you have it all backwards. And he says this in verse 29. Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So think of a relationship between a parent and a child. When a parent asks for the child to obey them, do they ultimately want the child simply to obey them? No, ultimately what the child is trying to get at is that the child would learn to trust the parent and learn the virtue of what the, ch the parent is trying to teach them, which is righteousness. And so, in the same way, Jesus is more interested in a relationship with these people than he is in simply providing their physical needs. He wants them to be welcomed into his spiritual fulfillment. And obedience for us as Christians is a response to that beautiful gift that Jesus has already given us. So the work of God in every Christian believer is a faith work. It's not a, a physical work. And that's why Jesus came into the world. He was obedient on our behalf when we couldn't be obedient. He pleased God in a way that we couldn't please God because we had sin. And so, by doing this, Jesus has incurred all of the penalty of disobedience that we might be welcomed into a trusting of God. And that's what is ultimately driving our obedience is, well, the Bible says I should live my life this way. Jesus has lived his life in this way. And even though I might not understand it, I might not even, uh, I might not even 
like it sometimes. There's something deeper going on here. God has my best interest at heart, and I trust him. And I'm going to, to set aside those things in my life that I know that aren't pleasing to him because I want to be closer to him. Not simply to get something from him. I want him. I want to get God. And so verse 30, the people kept persisting with Jesus. Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? They're saying, well, if you want us to believe in you, show us a miracle. Again, what work do you perform? And then they pointed back to the Israelites in the wilderness. Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness, as it was written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I love the emphasis here. I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven, but my father gives you true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said, sir, not Lord, sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. And so as we gather at the table this holiday season, let's remember these words of Jesus. That Christmas is ultimately to reveal three things to us. The first one is that we who are sinners have been hungry for the wrong things. You know, it's easy to get swept up with the crowd. It's easy to chase after what they chase after. Fame, maybe romance, maybe power, whatever is new and exciting of the day. But you know what? At the end, those things don't last. Those things are here for a season and gone. And what happens? On the other side of it, you're still disappointed and you're still hungry. You're hungry for something more than that. The second thing that Christmas teaches us is that only Jesus can offer us a spiritual bread that will satisfy our deepest hunger, which is to be loved by God himself. You know, it's not what we do that saves us. It's not the gifts that we can even bring to God. It's what Jesus has done for us. We don't have to hustle it from him or from God. He gives it freely to those who want it. And Jesus is offering eternal life to the crowd that he had just offered physical bread to. But many of the, these, that crowd was quite content with just a few more meals, physical meals. And the question for us as we see this story today is, this Christmas, are we ready to sit down spiritually at the banquet table of God and to be fed with faith, to let Jesus be our hope, to take him at his word and let him be our purpose and our mission and our love, to let the word of God, the Bible itself, Fill us up each and every day as we walk in his footsteps. Friends, are you ready to trust him like this and let him be the one who fills you up? And the third thing that Christmas teaches us, as we see in the Bible here, is that there is no greater gift that we can give the people in our lives than the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Christmas food is so wonderful. It brings us physical renewal, especially during this time of winter solstice when the night is longest and when the days are shorter and there's seasonal darkness, seasonal sadness, seasonal depression, but even more, Christmas food points us to the source of everlasting spiritual nourishment. And we can see Christ in all of these beautiful food traditions. Jesus is our almond, hidden away, the glory of God hidden in a human flesh. And it's, it's a delight to every sinner who finds him. Jesus is our, our gingerbread. He's the ginger in the bread. He preserves and he brings life to our spirit in this dark and sinful world. Jesus is our tamale. He's born a child wrapped in swaddling cloths who would later give his life to save the world from sin. And just as Jesus has invited the world to his table, we too can invite the world to ours as well. And we can tell them about Jesus that they too may be filled up with his love always. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much this Christmas season that you've laid before us beautiful traditions from around the world that remind us and point us to you, Jesus, our bread of life. And I pray, Lord, for every person out there right now that feels empty inside, that is longing for a deep, deeper spiritual nourishment that they might be refreshed. I pray, Lord, that they would put their trust in you, Jesus, because no one else, Lord, can fill us like you can. No one else can save us like you can. We thank you, Lord, for being our bread of life. We trust you in this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Merry Christmas.